In late 2019, people began falling ill. They had been infected with a novel coronavirus, SARS-CoV-2, resulting in the respiratory disease that we know as COVID-19. The medical and scientific community started working around the clock to answer some key questions about this new virus. For example, how is SARS-CoV-2 similar to and different from other coronaviruses? Why do some people get so sick from this virus while others may not show symptoms at all? What aspects of the environment cause the virus to spread so rapidly? What can we do to stop the spread? What treatments are available and how do we know that they work effectively? While urgent, these questions are difficult to answer accurately and completely on very short notice. Meanwhile, the virus had quite the head start in our highly interconnected society. It took only a handful of weeks for us to spread SARS-CoV-2 across the world. The scientific approach to answering these questions takes time to work because there's a lot that we need to find out and piece together. Imagine assembling a jigsaw puzzle without the picture that's on the box. Oh, and also the puzzle pieces are hidden all over the place. Oh, and I also forgot to say that the puzzle is enormously large and new pieces keep appearing each time you're able to complete part of the puzzle. Here's another analogy from neuroscientist Stuart Firestein. Imagine looking for a black cat in a dark room, and there may not actually be a cat in the room. The good news is that in science, there isn't just one person putting together the jigsaw puzzle, or one person looking for that cat who may or may not be hiding in the room. Science is a collaborative process, a framework for understanding the natural world. The scientific process depends on our ability to do the following to ask good questions and develop hypotheses, and to design and conduct experiments that could help support or rule out the hypotheses. We rarely answer a scientific question based on the outcome of one experiment alone. That would be like deciding the outcome of a basketball tournament based on one free throw instead of playing lots of games. The scientific community needs reports of many experiments, testing a hypothesis from multiple perspectives in order to collectively decide that we've answered a question. And it's usually the case that answering a question causes dozens of more new questions to pop up. In this way, science is a process that is never done. But it doesn't stop there. Science also depends on communication of the results to other scientists and also to stakeholders and policymakers. Right now, it's important to really focus on the part about communicating results, because this process may be unclear to those who haven't done it themselves. In the midst of the COVID-19 pandemic, everyone wants to know the answers to time-sensitive questions. There's a lot at stake. Communicating what we understand about COVID-19 is necessary for data-informed decision-making to help slow the spread of the disease and improve treatments, and ultimately saving lives. In addition, we will be better equipped to understand the next pandemic that arises at some unknown future date. Even though you might have the image of the lone scientist working long hours by themselves in their lab, science is actually highly collaborative, and lots of work nowadays is done by teams. Let's consider a team of scientific researchers that has conducted an experiment to test a hypothesis about COVID-19. They designed a careful experiment to make sure they were isolating the variable that they wanted to test while minimizing the effect of additional confounding variables. They replicated the experiment and included a large enough sample size to be confident in their results. They analyzed their data using statistical tests and interpreted the results in the context of other relevant studies that have already been communicated. They are then able to draw conclusions about their hypothesis. At the same time, teams of scientists are also looking at the big picture by conducting meta-analyses and or systematic reviews. Meta-analyses and systematic reviews statistically summarize the results of many studies published on the same topic in order to help draw broad conclusions about a particular research question. In any case, the researchers' work is not done. They need to communicate their results to others. Here we will focus on how they communicate results within the scientific community. A crucial part of the process is the incorporation of peer review and feedback at various time points. 
Oftentimes, scientists will start by seeking relatively informal feedback from others. This could be presentations at internal lab meetings or posters or talks at scientific conferences. In these venues, other experts on the topic can learn more about the work, ask questions, and discuss their ideas and interpretations of the results. Gathering this informal feedback helps the researchers craft the strongest possible written product to publish within the broader scholarly conversation. During the drafting stage, the authors may elicit informal peer feedback on their writing, kind of like how a student may go to their college writing center to get feedback on an essay. After countless hours of writing, revising, seeking feedback, revising again, editing, and formatting, the authors submit their manuscript to a journal to be peer-reviewed ahead of publication. The journal's editor asks two to four other experts, those are the peers, to carefully review the manuscript and comment on its strengths and weaknesses. This includes, but is not limited to, the novelty of the research question, the quality of the experiments, the soundness of the data interpretation, and the clarity of writing. The editor then synthesizes the contents of the peer reviews and communicates a decision to the authors. The manuscript might be accepted, rejected, or invited to be revised and resubmitted. An editor might decide to reject a manuscript for various reasons. These may include, but are not limited to poor fit for the scope of the journal, a lack of novelty, major flaws with the experimental design or analysis of results, or unclear communication within the manuscript. If the manuscript is rejected, the author might decide to revise it and submit it to a different journal, and the process starts again. If the manuscript is a revise and resubmit, the authors make revisions to the manuscript, sometimes even including additional experiments or analyses that reviewers may have asked for, and resubmit it back to the editor. Typically, the editor will accept the article following satisfactory revision. Very rarely is an article accepted as is without revision of any kind. Once an article has been accepted, it goes through some final rounds of editing and more formatting and finally becomes published in the journal. It used to be that journals were published in paper issues, like magazines. Now it's common for the PDFs of accepted articles to be made available as unformatted author manuscripts almost immediately after acceptance. So at this point, you might be thinking, wow, this whole process must take a while. You are absolutely correct. The scientific publishing process, from manuscript submission to article publication, can last anywhere from weeks to months. This doesn't even include the time that the authors take to prepare their manuscript in the first place. Especially during a pandemic like COVID-19, these weeks to months represent valuable time that scientists and policymakers need to put towards making decisions and recommendations. There is an urgent need for sound, peer-reviewed scientific research as we seek to understand more about the pandemic. One solution to the need for rapid information sharing is the rise of preprint servers in scientific publishing. Common in fields such as physics since the 1990s, preprint servers such as archive.org are places where scientists can post their manuscripts prior to submitting them to a journal. More recently, biomedical sciences have jumped on the preprint bandwagon with BioArchive and MedArchive launching in the mid-2010s. Preprint servers are beneficial because the information is immediately and freely available to all as soon as authors post their manuscripts. Another benefit is that anyone can comment on manuscripts posted to the server. Commenting provides the opportunity for a crowdsourced peer review of the document which the authors might use to improve their manuscript before submitting it to a journal. One downside to preprint servers is that the manuscripts may be mistaken for peer-reviewed articles if the reader is not aware of the difference between the two. This is not to suggest that all preprints are wrong. Plenty of them do become published in journals eventually. But the reader must understand that these manuscripts are not yet formally vetted by peers and accepted for publication. Searching for scientific information about COVID-19 will return many kinds of sources in a way that may be confusing. Of course, there are plenty of research articles, review articles, systematic reviews, and meta-analyses that have been peer-reviewed and published in journals. 
There are also tens of thousands of manuscripts that have not been peer-reviewed, but have been posted to preprint servers like BioArchive and MedArchive. Scientific databases such as PubMed have also begun indexing preprints as part of the National Library of Medicine Preprint Pilot Project. And MIT has begun a journal called Rapid Reviews COVID-19 to provide rapid peer reviews to preprints. There are also articles published in so-called deceptive or predatory journals. These are journals that look legitimate, but don't in fact have peer review and are essentially a pay-to-play type of academic publishing. Deceptive journals often have titles very close to legitimate scholarly journals. All of these sources, peer-reviewed articles, preprints, and deceptive articles, can show up in Google Scholar searches. As you locate information about COVID-19, or any topic really, it's very important to understand how your search strategies return these various types of sources and to be able to choose the most trustworthy sources from which to gather information. Between online publishing, preprint servers, and deceptive journals, today's information landscape looks very different than those that existed during past pandemics. Being aware of today's landscape is crucial to being able to find and interpret the information needed for sound decision making.